Lisa Haven here and I am here at Freedom Force International in Phoenix, Arizona and look who I stumbled upon but Lord Mockton. Uh, he's got lots of great information that I'm so totally stoked to share with you and when I heard you were going to be here uh, at this event I thought I'm I'm totally gonna go. <laughs> so, will you um, tell everyone who you are exactly for those who may not know? You are, ladies and gentlemen, in the presence of greatness, though in <laughs> my case it's only inherited. Uh, I am Christopher Walter, in fact, the Right Honourable Christopher Walter, third Viscount Monkton of Brenchley. That makes me a peer of the realm or a lord uh, in the Parliament of the United Kingdom, though the uh, since my father and most of the hereditary peers were ejected by a socialist government a few years ago, um, I don't have a seat in the house, but I have a voice, and that's what you'll hear today. Absolutely. And he's got tons of information he's going to be sharing today. Um, uh, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, I guess what's going on worldwide and what you see playing out right now in, in the world as a whole? Let's start there. The great divide in politics, the two sides in politics, were first meditated upon by the early Chinese imperial philosophers. Uh, and they said that the divide was between what they called the legalists on the one hand and the Confucians on the other. The legalists, legalists we would call them totalitarians. The left, the fascists, the communists, the socialists, they're all the same. And these are people who think they know best about everything. They have only one party line to which they expect us as well as themselves to adhere. And they want to interfere down to the minutest detail into every uh, aspect of our lives, down to the last dimly flickering poison-filled mercury light bulb, which you can't even read by. And if you break it, it's a, an international disaster. So um, they want to interfere in our households, in our homes, in our families, in the way we do things, in the way we work, the way we don't work, the way we play, everything we do, they want to control it. So that's the legalists, as the Chinese the imperial philosophers used to call them, and we would call them the totalitarians, or socialists, or fascists, or communists. That's that side. On the other side, there are the Confucians, and we would call them the libertarians, the live and let live brigade. People who are not anxious either to have their own lives interfered with or to interfere with the lives of other people. They want everyone just to be able to get on with their own thing without being told they can't and without being pushed around by the state. And that, said the Chinese philosophers, is the big divide in politics. And Confucius, if you've ever read his Analects, it's a very charming book. And he is an enlightened man who realises that the centralizing tendency of the emperors and their, their propensity to interfere with enormous bureaucratic control was uh, not only undesirable but unpleasant and uncivilized and he conveys this without ever quite saying it because if he had said it out loud then the emperor would have had him executed so it all had to be done in code but it's a very delightful book and it was from Confucius's libertarian attitude that the notion of uh, Confucianism or, or uh, libertarianism grew. And so the, this is the, the great divide in politics. And remarkably, even though government is normally by instinct legalist, it wants to interfere. People who go into politics go into politics because they want to tell other people how they must live yes. and get rich doing it. Um, that uh, divide suddenly um, the libertarians are beginning unexpectedly to prevail. It will only be a temporary advantage that we have because government is instinctually about governing, it's about interfering in other people's lives. It is therefore, it has a propensity to be legalist. And the objective, of course, of the founding fathers of the United States with your constitution was to circumscribe the power of totalitarian government to prevent it from exercising too rigid and too rigorous and too interfering and too detailed and too expensive a control over the lives, property and dealings of individual citizens. And unexpectedly from time to time the Confucians, that's the likes of all of us, suddenly prevailed and we had the vote 
for Britain to leave the European tyranny by clerk and of course that uh, tyranny run by 30 faceless, grossly overpaid and grossly overpowerful commissars yep. who are not elected by anyone. That was the reason why those of us, if you like, in the governing class who decided that we wanted to leave voted against it because it was anti-democratic, not just non-democratic, it was anti-democratic. And the working classes voted against it because they too sensed it was anti-democratic, but they knew that it was causing mass immigration to Britain. And Britain hadn't made sufficient provision in the number of hospitals, the number of houses, the transport infrastructure to cope with suddenly very nearly a million extra people every year in our tiny island which only has 60 million people in it to start with. So working people felt that aspect of the dictator's control very strongly and so they voted against it. And so Brexit was successful and I was a, a leading member of the party, the United Kingdom Independence Party, that achieved Brexit and Nigel Farage who has been working for this cause for 30 or 40 years, yeah. he as the leader of the party was the voice of freedom and that voice was splendidly heard Good. and by 52% to 48 we voted to leave and the establishment are furious of course the governing establishment is instinctually legalist they love the European Union because it's more rules, more regulations, more bossing about and so they were very upset when the British people said two fingers to that lot we've had enough we want that <laughs> so that was Brexit but then to add glory to glory we have had the unexpected election of Donald Trump as president in, uh, of the United States and this of course has caused huge excitement in the Brexit camp no surprise that the first British politician that Donald Trump saw shortly after his election was Nigel Farage, Farage. they've become <laughs> very good friends and Nigel has been advising him on certain presentational aspects in particular of uh, the campaign and of how to then go about uh, mending fences once you've had the campaign because that's always important. So you have your row and then you get on with it, you don't go on arguing. <laughs> and so uh, Trump is showing very good signs of having taken that advice to heart and it's a very exciting time because we now have not only the, I mean, all the left-wing media, which means very nearly all of them, are saying... Yeah, all the, the mainstream the, the, media. Yeah, the, the Mark Street media, let's call yes. it. They are all saying, oh, but this is the wealthiest cabinet that has ever been assembled, except possibly for that of uh, Jack Kennedy, who, if I remember, was a Democrat. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's no monopoly on billionaires, it seems to me, in the political party. But what the press should be saying for balance if they were going to be fair about this, is that this is shaping up to be far and away the best qualified and most competent cabinet that has ever been assembled by any American president. Amen to and this to me is a most startling development. I've been what glued to Fox News ever since I got here, because we get it only patchily in, in the remotest corners of the Cotswolds. But, do they, um, but do here, they limited monitor it? Or? No, it's just the signal is awful. But um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fog gets yes. in the way. But uh, the, uh, the thing about this is, is that, that I've been watching as each appointment uh, was announced, and he was delightful yesterday because he was at his first thank you rally and he went to Ohio where he unexpectedly won that by 10 clear percentage points in a, uh, in a blue state that was yep. also a very heavily working class state because all the ver workers have suddenly realised that these communist intellectuals like uh, Barack Hussein Obama yep. and, and Hillary Rodham Clinton these are not people who have the slightest concern for the future of the working class. No. They are ideologues, poisonous communist ideologues, who wish to shut down capitalism. Yes. And capitalism is what gives the workers their jobs, and they know this. And so their worm, the worm has turned, and this is a very, very important change. Because it may be, if, if Trump plays his cards right, and if he can deliver, then, and he can cement the alliance between republicanism and the uh, working classes that he has so well begun with the carrier uh, settlement, for instance, stopping the manufacturer of 
air conditioning units yeah, from here. relocating. I think he saved 800 of the jobs that oh, would yes. otherwise have gone to Mexico. Yep. Saved now, jobs admittedly, uh, the cost of that was uh, at least uh, 11 million dollars for 800 jobs yeah. and you certainly can't afford to pay that every time and still have a functioning economy at the end of it. So let's be clear, this was a propaganda device and not a genuine solution, but of course it's gone down terribly well all the same, which is after all the point of propaganda devices. Yes. But nevertheless, I, I uh, had the privilege of addressing 100,000 mine workers from West Virginia on a mountain top uh, in the state, which had been a coal mine, they'd restored it back to being a mountain top after they'd taken the coal yeah. out. And so there was this area the size of five football pitches, and it was just as well it was that big, because 100,000 mine workers came and I was on this huge sound stage interacting with them and telling them why they didn't need to worry that global warming was a real problem that was yeah. destroying their jobs. The only thing that was destroying their jobs, I said, are the Democrats. And I said, I'm sorry to be political, I know that many of you perhaps support them, but you should realise that they will destroy your jobs if they can. Obama has declared war on coal. I don't he even know if the Democratic clear. Party really exists anymore. It's kind of gone all progressive socialist minded. Well, it is really a communist party now, it is. in all but name. The policies they follow, uh, the leaders that have Obama, after all, was the son of a communist. Yeah. His mentors and trainers were communist. Yeah. Uh, his policies were communist. His attempt to destroy the American economy by overborrowing, which may yet succeed, is yes. communist. Um, everything he's done is communist. But of course, if you use the word communist, they very craftily repackaged it so that if you use the word communist, they say, well, you're being extreme because you use the word communist. Well, I'm old fashioned and I come from Yorkshire, where we call a spade a bloody shovel. <laughs> and so if it exactly, walks call it what it like is. a communist and quacks like a communist, it is then a maybe communist. it is a communist. And right. I'm going to call it a communist. I'm going to call it what I see it to be. So I'm very encouraged that we've now had not only Brexit, but also the election of Donald Trump. These are two big freedom movements, in my opinion, that I think we're not only witnessing, it's a glo I think it's a global thing. It's catching on globally. People are waking up to what's going on. Do you feel that? Uh, no, I don't. I think they have not the faintest idea what's really going on. <laughs> <laughs> because the left are very careful to conceal their true intentions and what they're really up to. And unless one studies it in enormous detail, it's very difficult to point out how wrong they are. And this brings us really to the climate subject, which is the purpose of the Freedom Force Congress yes. this year. It's on the subject of the climate. I'm giving the keynote closing address after dinner uh, tomorrow. And I will be declaring the end of the climate scale. Because I have done the homework and got in among the weeds and done the mathematics and I have, after ten years looking, discovered a large and significant error in their mathematics by which they have exaggerated very considerably the upper bound of their prediction of how much warming we'll get per doubling of CO2. Their upper end prediction where they say it might be four and a half or five or six or eight or ten or twelve or thirteen Celsius. I can now rule out everything above two and a half Celsius as simply being entirely unphysical. They made a mistake in their calculations. A mistake, a mistake. or purposeful, you think? Well, uh, it's not for me to say. <laughs> I, I can't tell. All I've done is to discover that there is a mistake. It's not an obvious one, which is why for 30 years this mistake has been made. It's, it was made in the first papers that ever discussed the application of what are called feedback mathematics to the climate. Um, and the first two papers on that were Hansen in 1984 and Schlesinger in 1985. Both those papers explicitly contain this error. And all the key uh, textbooks, uh, Pechotto and Ort, for instance, and Curry, all these major textbooks on climate mathematics, they contain this error. And the documents of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change contain this error. It's everywhere. And this error is the basis for this notion that we might be just about to pass a tipping point where everything becomes irreversible and the climate spirals away to an enormous heat and the sea level rises and doom and gloom. None of this is going to happen and I can prove it first time we're not just dealing with differences of interpretation or well you know the 
that they say well, the temperature would go up by this much and it's only gone up by that much and so they were wrong. No, this is an actual error of physics. And it's a very exciting moment because it is. I haven't yet managed to get this error into the peer-reviewed journals and before, until I do that, it won't really take me, people won't really take it seriously. But I did get it reviewed privately before I sent it for review to the Bulletin of the Chinese Academy of Sciences where they're now looking at it. And I sent it to two very eminent physicists, one of whom is perhaps the world's foremost uh, practicing physicist. And I won't say who he is because it makes him embarrassed, but he's very, very expert. <laughs> and he at first said, this paper is too long and rambling. So I tightened it and sent it back to him. And then he said, I like this paper. <laughs> and there's nothing like it. So then I sent it to the world's expert on the particular corner of physics and mathematics that we're concerned with, is mathematics and feedbacks, as it applies to the climate. And there's one man who specializes in this, has written dozens of papers over the years on it, papers that are way too complicated for me to understand. Uh, and he looked at it and he also said, this is far too complicated, you must simplify it, you must explain what you're doing. So I rewrote it for him as well, sent it back. And then he said, ah, I see what you've done. He said, I printed out the paper, I cut out your figure two and your figure six, I put them side by side, now I can see what you're saying. And yes, he said, you're right. He said, if they do it this way, they will get a wrong answer. It will be an exaggeration. So it's a mathematical formula. So it is a mathematical theory. mistake. It's an error of physics. Uh, it's, uh, it's an actual mistake. It's not something that they can say, well, you know, you might argue it this way, you might argue it that way. It is an error. It's a frank error. It arose because the climate scientists of today, on the whole, not very good at mathematics, were <laughs> unfamiliar with the conic section. Now the conic sections were known to the Egyptians and to the very, very early ancient Greeks by the 7th century BC. They were, they were incorporating parabolas, ellipses and hyperbolas, the three conic sections, into the design of the Doric temple. The Parthenon being a good example in the 5th century, but it was still using this mathematics. And then in the 4th century, in about 340 BC, uh, the uh, mathematician Menachemus of Alapeconisos studied the conic sections and wrote a famous paper in which he was able to use the intersection of a rectangular hyperbola and a parabola to determine the solution to one of the longest standing problems in ancient mathematics, which is the problem of the duplication of the cube. And you may say, what's all this got to do with the climate? The duplication of the cube, uh, a cube of, of edge one, Yep. and you want to have two cubes that have the same volume as that one cube, edge one, what is the edge length of those two cubes? And that's the problem. And by this intersection, you can actually identify the solution to the problem. That's what he did. Now, of course, most mathematicians in, in climate, they don't really know what a hyperbolic curve looks like. So when I saw, when I actually plotted for myself, the temperature response curve, in relation to the magnitude of the feedbacks that were being put into the system. It was a rectangular hyperbolic curve and I recognized it. And I thought, well if the curve is that shape then what they're doing can't be right. This was 10 years ago. And ever since then I have been looking to find out what the heck they did to get these silly exaggerations that I could see they were getting. Right. And just a few weeks ago I found the answer was an electronics engineer rang up and he said, I've seen your paper last year in which you raised questions about this curve and the way they're using it. You say there's something wrong and you can't find it. He said, they are making a mistake. And he then told me about a mistake they were making, but it was a very small one and it didn't have much of an effect. You couldn't really tell the difference when you did the calculation, Great. whether you did it their way or... But nevertheless, he said, read the textbook anyway. So I read the textbook on this area of mathematics and at once saw that they had not only made this very small mistake that he'd spotted, but they'd made a far larger one. So I got back to him and said they'd made a much larger mistake. And eventually, after teasing a little, I told him what it was. 
He said, oh, that's not an error. You can do it either way. I said, yes, you can at a fixed point, but you can't if you're looking at a spread of estimates. In an electronic circuit, you aren't, because you know what the feedback is. But in the climate, we don't know what the feedback is. That's where it makes a difference. And he couldn't see it. And that told me that either I was wrong or the error was sufficiently subtle that it's difficult even for an expert to see. And so I, that's why I then wrote it down as a full-length paper, I tried to explain what I was talking about. Right. And then after a couple of goes of knocking it into shape, uh, we now have a, a version that people can understand. That's and good. and um, the, you know, the, the people, the experts who've read it, so far, on the whole, they say, uh, I'm right. There's one guy who said I was wrong who's got four degrees in this particular subject, <laughs> but he wouldn't say why. Oh. And I'm afraid I always discount people who say, you're wrong, and they won't tell you why. Yeah, because, agreed. Uh, they're usually just sour grapes or something. Whereas, you know, if a scientist says, oh, no, you've got this wrong, you've got that wrong, you've misunderstood the other, then you know where you are, and you can evaluate exactly. whether you really have got it wrong. Well, just to be told, you're wrong. That yes. doesn't hack it for me. <laughs> so anyway, this is a very exciting moment because I'm waiting to hear back from the Chinese about whether they're going to publish this paper. If they do, that issue of their journal will without question become one of the most famous issues they yes. ever printed. You don't know yet? or have you I don't know yet. I sent it to yet. them three weeks ago. I got an automatic acknowledgement. I haven't yet had a letter from the editors. Uh, they normally send it out for review, gather the reviews together and then send them to me for any corrections that may need to be made. Although, of course, the reviewers may say, we don't want this published, we think this is rubbish. But they have to say why. Yes, they do. I published a paper ooh, 18 months ago in the Chinese Science Bulletin, and, and two of the three reviewers turned it down flat first time. And both of them said, we can't have this paper being published. It disagrees with the party line. Oh my goodness, that's the only reason, and so, right? And so I wrote back to the editor and said, this is not on any view mm -hmm. a scientific objection. And I want you to go back to those reviewers and ask whether they have any scientific objections. Exactly. And so one of the two reviewers caved in straight away. He said, well, no, I didn't like the result but I realized it was right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to make any further objection. The other one, who was quite determined, he was from a, a North American university, I won't say where. <laughs> he, we're not supposed to know, but I found out. Um, <laughs> he was very naughty, and he then said, right. And he went through it, he made 52 things that he wanted correct. Um. And so my co-author said, oh, we better just let it go, it's too much work. I said, no, no, I'll just, it only take me a couple of hours. I'll just, yeah. work through and do all these things. They were relatively trivial things like, you know, should have used a different kind of equal sign here and that kind of thing. So, <laughs> so I just did all the changes yes. he wanted, sent them back. And then he said, well, he was most uh, uh, impressed and rather surprised that we'd been able to answer all his points. And we had answered them all to his satisfaction. But he had now done some further reading and he had concluded that global warming was not happening at the rate predicted because it was all going and, and hiding in the oceans. And this was the generally accepted consensus. <laughs> generally accepted consensus. A usual thing. So I then did, with my colleagues, a literature review. We went through the learned journals and we found 25 different reasons in the journals for why the warming that they predicted hadn't happened. So we listed all 25 of these different reasons with the different papers that supported these reasons. And we said there is no favored reason for why the models have got it wrong. But the one we prefer is that the models don't know what they're doing. They've got a mistake in them somewhere. And we then described the area in which we thought the mistake existed is the area where I subsequently found the error. And so that was the first time we had hinted there was an error. And then there was my further paper later last year explicitly asking about this area of mathematics and saying, can anybody help? Because I, you know, this doesn't smell right. Right. And then this year, thanks to that previous paper, bingo, we have the answer. I'm so excited about that. And so this will all be described in my talk tomorrow evening. I'm sorry to have banged on at no, such you're good. about this <laughs> abstruse corner it. of mathematics, but yes. what it does mean is that we think, and we have some good reason to suspect we may be right, because right. experts cleverer than us have said we're right, that we have found the error that effectively if you take away the error, you take away practically all of the climate scare. There's nothing left that's really worth worrying about. Right. Just on this error alone you'd be looking at a, a range of possible temperatures uh, increases per doubling of CO2 of just 
1.8 to 2.7 Celsius, best estimate 2.25. It's not enough, really, to be very exciting. So using their own mathematics against them, and I stand with you in that. I stand with you as a, as a, a news reporter and journalist, and you know, on that ground because we all know it's a sham. It's you know, global warning. They've they've been feeding this lie for so long in order to get their globalism. You see, politically, in. the difficulty is this that if you point out to them that global warming, since they first made predictions in 1990, right. uh, on the basis of what they said in the IPCC's first report, was substantial confidence that their models had captured all essential features of the climate. They made those predictions in 1990, and the rate of global warming since then has been less than half <laughs> yes. of what they then Run predicted down, yes. with substantial confidence. I literally updated my two satellite data sets today because it's the beginning of the new month and so we've now just this afternoon got the, de the details from the previous month and it is well below the rate of warming since 1990 is well below half of the central estimate that they then predicted and is well below even the lowest estimate that they then predicted. So it isn't happening as they predicted and that was one of the reasons why I thought they must be doing something wrong somewhere. And so I'm very glad that we've now found one of the things they're doing wrong. It's probably the biggest of the things they're doing wrong, because once you take this one away, then there just isn't very much else left to worry about. You're then dealing with very small numbers, which, if you correct for further errors, they just become smaller still, until the whole thing completely vanishes. So it is the beginning of the end. How long it will take for the world to catch on and to realise it's been had, and that the people that had told us it was settled science didn't know whether it was settled science or not. And there's an interesting consideration because the law of fraud says that if you're making money out of this, this is of course a lot of these scientists are. Oh yes, that they're going to And fight if it. you then say something with intent to deceive as well as intent to profit, it's a double intent you have to prove it's yes. fraud, then it's fraud. Yeah. Now, what is an intent to deceive? It's very interesting. If they tell you that the science is settled and they know it isn't settled, well, of course, that's a deception. Yes. But what is interesting is that in law, as in morality, if they say the science is settled and they don't know whether it is settled or not, that is every bit as big and as serious a lie and a fraud. That's how it works. That is how it works. Because you're making the same claim. You're saying, we know the science is settled. When either you know it isn't, or you don't know whether it is or it isn't, it's the same lie. And the courts re re view it with just the same seriousness. And so all these environmentalist pressure groups that have been raising vast funds from innocent oh, students yes. and, you know, droopy people who think they're doing favours to the environment when in fact they're subsidising communism. Um, <laughs> yes. And that's how Patrick Moore, the founder of Greenpeace, puts it. He says, if you give money to Greenpeace because you think you're favouring the environment, you're not. You're favouring the destruction of capitalism and the advance of world communism. If that's what you want, communism. then you give them some money. But if you want to improve the environment, don't bother because they don't do that anymore. <laughs> and that's from the founder of Greenpeace. Um, so we are now in a much stronger position to say to them, look, all of you, you environmental groups who have been going around saying the science is settled and raising money on the premise, then you were committing a fraud because you didn't know whether the science was settled or not and you said it was because it suited you and you were making a profit from it. That is fraud. And so Greenpeace and the Worldwide Fund for Nature and the uh, Natural Resources Defence Council, all these huge environmental organisations, budgets larger than your average African country. These are the real crony capitalists that Obama has been favouring so much over the last eight years. These people are all fraudsters. I call them out as fraudsters. Let them sue me if they dare. I'll put them in court and let's see how well they get on in trying to understand the mathematical error that exactly. I have now identified <laughs> in what they had said was the second sign. Well, we'll have to pray because I know that that's like, um, pray for you because it's a battle. You know, you're going to be, when it comes out and, and you put it all out there, I think you're going to get, you know, you're going to get some people fighting back. Big well, time the back. point is once the world knows they were wrong, they screwed up. Oh, yeah. Then 
this notion that there is a 97% consensus vanishes. Yeah. Because the 97% consensus was simply wrong. Yes. Now, of course, there wasn't actually a 97% no. consensus. The biggest lie, that I, the direct lie, that I think has been told in this entire debate was told by some Nazis in, <laughs> in, uh, at the University of Queensland in Australia. Thoroughly nasty pieces of work. And the, the head Nazi, who actually used to go around wearing a Nazi uniform and has photographs of himself on the web wearing a Nazi uniform, very, very nasty left-wing uh, piece of work. He published a paper in which he claimed to have reviewed 11,944 papers on climate change and related topics published in the learned journals of science over the 21 years 1991 to 2011. He published this paper in 2013 and he said that 97.1% of those papers had explicitly stated that most of the warming that's happened since about 1950, in the last few decades anyway, was man-made. Now after three weeks of trying, I managed to get hold of the data file in which they had listed and marked all 11,944 papers. They themselves had marked only 64 papers, which is 0.5% of the sample, <laughs> as having explicitly said that recent warming was mostly man-made. Wow. And they simply reported this as 97.1%. And then they wrote subsequent papers referring back to that one, saying there is a 97.1% consensus that most of the warming that's happened since 1950 is man-made. Mm. And it's simply a lie. It, it is, is a, a fraud. And Queensland police, who were asked by citizens of Queensland to look at this, because uh, he was very angry about it, they looked very carefully at what had been done by these people, these Nazis and found that a deception, and quite a nasty one, had indeed been perpetrated. But for political reasons they were not willing to prosecute. Because the current administration, uh, in the shape of Mr Turnbull, who was the Prime Minister of Australia, who again very foolishly jumped onto the climate change bandwagon at one stage like of his career, um, wouldn't allow them to prosecute. So, uh, criminal offence has plainly been committed, but uh, the Australians will not prosecute for it because the Prime Minister doesn't want them to. Amazing. Uh, it's a terrible interference in, in the way the, the, the investigation of these things should work, but that's how it is. And it, it's a very, very dirty game in which they will, they're now so desperate that they will tell a lie as staggeringly big as that one. I mean, to go from 0.3% to 97.1%, and to say that the two numbers are the same. I mean, this yeah. is beyond extraordinary. It is beyond. It's it. a very, very serious deception and a very influential one. Because you still hear your average Mark Stream commentator on the climate saying, well, you know, the Trump regime is out of tune with 97% oh, no, of scientists. Not. And that figure comes from these Nazis. Nazis. Who want to introduce. And they, that's, you know, they themselves dress up in Nazi uniform. <laughs> I'm not making it up. No. Uh, they're thoroughly nasty pieces of work. And um, they, uh, one of them, I think, has now, in fact, come to the United States. The guy who wears the Nazi uniform. He better not try wearing it I here. Know, I don't get think he get very far. <laughs> he won't get um, far. But he's come, he's come here because I think he was getting wind of the fact they might have prosecuted him there. Wow. And of course, once you've left the country, it's harder to prosecute. It is harder. However, you know, we're still keeping an eye on that Good. because it is so monstrous a lie that it has to be stopped. And this is really one of the things that is so dangerous about all this. It's not so much that trillions have been squandered. Uh, the real moral issue here is, is a very important one. It's the one in which I either begin or end my speeches on, on the climate thing, and, and, and that is this, that a million people a month from among the 1.2 thousand million people in the world who don't have electricity die before their time because they don't have electricity. That's a holocaust, six million deaths every six months, two holocausts a year, caused because the international community, instead of getting together at these huge international conferences and giving coal-fired, cheap, reliable, baseload, low-maintenance electricity to everyone who needs it worldwide, which you could do for a tiny fraction of you the trillions could. every yeah. year they're spending on this non-problem of global warming, which we can now prove is a non-problem. Um, this is a terrible um, 
It's the crime of death by indifference. It is. They don't care how many they kill to pursue their ghastly ideology, and they are killing a million a month. That's it's a fairly conservative estimate. The UN, to give you an example, says that two million a year, so that's two months worth, are killed just by one cause that arises from not having electricity, which is breathing in particulates from smoke in smoke-filled huts over which they do their cooking and eating. It's very sad. And Two million die just from that. And then you've got the ones that die because they've got infections and they can't be treated because there's no way of refrigerating the, the antivirals or the antibacterials. You have all these problems. Um, you know, they, 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 kind of, they don't have light, so they get uh, eye diseases. They, there's so many reasons why if you don't have electricity, you end up dead at a far younger age than you would if you had electricity. That's true. And the sad thing is it's all part of their agenda. Now, do you have any, um, if people want to touch base with you or find, I love hearing all your stuff. You, I could go on for hours with you. But do you have any information or a website if people want to um, touch base? Or well, the best place to go is probably whatsupwiththat.com. W-A-T-T-S, upwiththat.com. I write there occasionally. It's been a bit less frequent than usual recently because I've been working on this paper. Yes, uh, amazing you know, paper. The era. And I did try some of the early ideas for that paper at What's Up With That, but so many trolls came in and tried to derail it that I, in the end I just said, I'm going to stop until I publish the paper. <laughs> I then know I'll about trolls back. on my channel. I <laughs> yes, <laughs> I and this is well. a big problem. I mean, they do, uh, enormous amounts of money are spent by the totalitarians communists, the fascists, the Nazis, yeah. on trying to stop people like me from speaking. Indeed, I had to write very sharply just last week to a professor, Richard Palmcutt, at Graz in Austria, at the university there, whom I'd written to three years ago when he had put up a blog posting saying that everyone who disagreed with his personal views on the climate should be executed. Oh. So I wrote to him and pointed out that in Austria, as then also in Scotland where I was, it was a hate crime to demand the execution of those you disagreed with. Good. And that if he didn't retract and withdraw and apologise within 12 hours, I would report him to the Austrian police and would require them to prosecute via Interpol. I could do that. Good. Yeah. There are some privileges the peers of the realm still has. And <laughs> For now, so, anyway. So he very sensibly backed off and apologised. Three years later, he does it again. So, and I didn't see it for a few months, but then I happened to come across it. So somebody drew it to my attention. They said, you know, didn't you stop this person before? So I wrote to him again. And I said, if you do not take this down immediately, I'm not even going to give you time this right. time, uh, I will go to the Austrian police and you will be arrested and you will be in prison for a very long time because this is a second offence and you've been warned before. And so he said that pending taking further legal advice, he would take it down, he took it down again. <laughs> um, and with luck, he won't put it back. But they're, they're, now, these death threats are almost daily occurrences. And, uh, I mean, not to me personally, just right. to, to climate skeptics. Right. I'm not trying to glorify myself by saying no, I am I so it. important to them that they're, they're giving me death threats. Don't you get me wrong. <laughs> I am saying that there, there's an increasing number of demands by the the, the climate Nazis, as, as Roy Spencer calls them, um, to that, that those who disagree with them, even though, as we now know, those who disagree with them are in the right and it's they who are in the wrong, should be executed, not just in prison, executed, or sent to psychiatric institutions. That's, That's the levels that the they go day. to. The, the and the there are dozens of these, and for instance, yes. there's a, there's a, rid a lick ridiculous figure called Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know, that <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know the guy at all. And he did a YouTube video the other day in which he said that anyone who disagreed with him on climate change should be put in his garage with his mouth to the exhaust pipe of the car to see how long he would live. And of course, he wouldn't live very long because it's not the carbon dioxide in the exhaust that's killing, <laughs> it's the carbon monoxide. But then right, Schwarzenegger yeah, has never struck me as being particularly the brightest <laughs> shilling in the piggy bank. So, um, I don't think he really understood this, but he didn't that, understand. that kind of offensive, deliberately oh um, hate-provoking language Definitely. is now illegal in some European countries, Austria being one of them. Wow. And I sometimes think, given how much of this is going on now, 
and how often we have those people say this kind of thing. The danger is that it builds up and builds up and becomes eventually part of normal discourse. And that's, and that's, that's, that's the when, problem. And that's yeah. when the killings start. Yes. And that's exactly what happened in Nazi Germany. They kept on trying it on and pushing yeah. the envelope and saying more and more outrageous things about their opponents. We will round you up, we will kill you, we will put you in gas chambers, we will this, that and the other. And everybody thought they were just joking or just being nasty. Oh. But they meant it. And what they were doing was getting people inured to this idea by constant repetition and, and seeing whether anyone would hit back. Nobody did. And eventually they just started doing it. And six million ended up dead from that one. And eventually 250 million as a result of all the wars that both the fascist and the communists Absolutely. caused in, in, in the 20th century. So it is time for us to realise that it is we who stand on the moral high ground on the question of climate change. It is they who are not only killing a million a month by refusing to allow coal-fired power to be given to the nations that desperately need it and by diverting the funds that would be used to give that coal-fired power to them uh, to be squandered on windmills and solar panels and other such fripperies and fatuity. Uh, such like fooleries as the Catholic Catechism in England used to say. Um, uh, but also they're now advocating increasingly and with increasing stridency and nastiness witness Schwarzenegger's recent YouTube video yep. that people should be killed uh, by uh, unpleasant means if they dare to disagree with the uh, Nazi party line on climate. So what do we do about this? Well, I think we do have to outlaw that kind of hate speech. Otherwise, it just gathers the momentum and they will no doubt say, well, it's our freedom of speech, we can say we can kill anybody we want. No, actually you can't. It's called murder incitement to murder. It's a crime under the US Criminal Code. And I'm working out at the moment whether I should prosecute Schwarzenegger for incitement to murder for this video and to prosecute YouTube who were asked to take it down and didn't. And I think we've got to start doing this. And so that the mood music goes the other way. If you use this kind of violent, nasty, evil language, advocating the deaths of your opponents, the not because parts. they're wrong, but because they're right. Well, the hard part then, is they'll push it on both sides. Then, then no, 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 because we don't use that kind of language. No, I don't go around saying I'm gonna all these climate no change, <laughs> you know, these Greenpeace people should be killed. That's not the kind of language I use. Or imprisoned, right. unless they've committed a crime. Uh, but the idea of just saying, well, because they disagree with the climate, everybody should be killed. No, that's not the way we talk. We have nothing to fear from a law that says you may not advocate the death of those who disagree with publicly. You know, if you say it privately, in a to a few people who are friends with you, that's one another matter. But if, if you go on YouTube and you're a famous figure and you preach death to those you disagree with politically, that is a crime of incitement to murder. It's a crime under the existing code. And I think I might see whether I can't um, put it in front of the police and get it prosecuted. You have a criminal code in this country which is democratically agreed. And that criminal code says that if people go around inciting to murder, they are committing a criminal offence. That is not murder. a kind of free speech that is allowed. You have to understand there are limits yeah, to free there are speech. Limits. And that, like it or not, is one of them. Well. I love your stuff. <laughs> so I'm so excited I got the chance of a lifetime to interview. I know you got flown in for this event. And I absolutely love everything that you do. And I back you 100% in um, what's going on with, you know, the, the global warming, crime, climate change, just chaos that's being paraded here. So I'm with you on that. And I cannot wait um, to hear more on your speech tomorrow here at this event. So thank you again for coming on my broadcast. I really appreciate it. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all for watching. If you've watched this long, don't edit it down too much. <laughs> I let won't it edit run. it at all. <laughs> It'll it be straight. I will let it fly. Well, God so. bless America. And if you do come across any more examples of death threats against climate skeptics, get in touch with me, monkton at mail.com, and tell me, because the prosecutions are about to start, both for the frauds, No, it is going to get worse. And also for the incitements there. to murder. We're not going to have this criminal behavior any longer because it is dangerous. It is dangerous. You see, it's not a question to say, well, freedom of speech. No. They go on and on and on at this. They've been saying this for years now, with virtually no opposition. 
and that's when it becomes dangerous. That is what led to the rise of Hitler because his people used exactly the same language the climate Nazis of today are using and he went on doing it it only took a generation and then everybody was talking that language and then the killing started and it went on in the millions and then the tens of millions and then the hundreds of millions you have to nip it in the bud and that is what the law of incitement to murder is precisely intended to do that makes sense well, thank you guys again for tuning into my channel here. This is Lisa Haven and Lord Mockton <laughs> signing out.